Hi, everybody attending our conversation today. My name is Alicia Smith, and I apologize in advance for my camera not working, but just consider me a voice out in the, in the void. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, thank you for joining us. Like Brian said, we really are so grateful that you're interested in our Distinguished Speaker Series. You're going to hear a lot of great information today. Um, before we jump into the conversation, um, again, my name is Alicia Smith. I am the Associate Director of Training for Career Launch at Perkins School for the Blind. Career Launch is an innovative training and career services program helping blind and visually impaired young adults land career track jobs. In our 14 month program, we train young adults in, for jobs in customer success. And then we work with them to find, apply for and succeed in those jobs. Tonight is our second part of our Distinguished Speaker Series, in which we showcase people with visual disabilities who have led exemplary lives in um, work and within their personal lives. These people are extraordinary role models for our career launch trainees, as well as students at Perkins School for the Blind, and indeed really for us all. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things for this webinar. We, Brian, my colleague Brian will be leading the conversation with our guest speaker, Pam, and we will be taking some questions from the audience towards the end of the conversation. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature of this webinar to submit your questions. You can submit them at any time um, during the conversation and we will be, again, we will be um, discussing them at the end. And then the second thing to make a note of, this session is being recorded and will be available um, via link after, after um, everything's finished. So um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Brian Switzer, who will be in conversation with Pam tonight. Brian is um, the Access Technology Instructor for Career Launch. He works with our participants to develop their skills in office systems and tools, including everything from effectively browsing the web to working efficiently with tools such as Salesforce, Microsoft Office, and Google Suite. He also teaches access technology, how to use it effectively um, with your mainstream office technology. Out of the classroom, Brian is an avid athlete and consulted on the accessibility of fitness apps such as RunKeeper and Strava. Over to you, Brian. Terrific. Thank you so much, Oicha. Uh, and with the Olympic happening this summer, it's really exciting to have Pam McConnell with us. Uh, if you guys don't know Pam, uh, she is a, a four-time Paralympian in four different Paralympic Games, starting with the 1992 Games in Barcelona, where she earned a gold medal in the 3,000 meter and two bronze medals in the 800 meter and the 1,500 meter event. Pam also competed in Atlanta 1996, Sydney 2000, and Athens 2004 Paralympic Games. During her athletic career, she competed in many world and national championships and held national and world records in at various distances. Um, her love of running continued today at a retinal level with her guiding eye for the blind uh, running guide dog named Maida, who weeds her way. Over the last 20 years, Pam uh, ha had built her career in the nonprofit sector. Uh, she's currently the Director of Development and Communication in the Overbrook School in Philadelphia. Uh, Pam is the former chair of the board of directors for the National Organization uh, for Albinism and Hypopigmentation, also known as NOAA. She continued to serve the organization as a volunteer, helping with fundraising, governance, and other admin roles. In her spare time, Pam and her family enjoy tandem biking, running, hiking, and just about any kind of athletic pursuit. 
Um, so we're very excited to have Bam here, uh, world-renowned Bam McDonald, uh, super athlete, uh, and someone who's visually impaired as well, uh, who also has an illustrious career um, in the nonprofit sector. Um, so Bam, if you don't mind me asking, I know you. we mentioned you're the director uh, at the Overbrook School for the Blind in Philadelphia um, for the um, Office of Development and Communication. Um, what, uh, so as far as schooling go, um, what kind of college, um, did you have to, um, obtain in order to lead you down that path? So my undergraduate degree is, uh, it was actually a BS in, um, um, health and physical education. So I actually studied teaching and then I, um, pursued a graduate degree at the University of Northern Colorado. Um, with an emphasis in sport administration, uh, where I had the opportunity at that time to be exposed to the uh, United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee and learned more about nonprofit management and fundraising at that time. That's amazing. I'm so glad to hear that uh, teaching helped led you the, that way. Uh, I know I'm finishing up my uh, master in education and uh, you know the teaching degrees are so useful and so many different pursuits, even if you don't end up in teaching per se or end up teaching a little, a little bit and then moving on to other pursuits. Um, what Can you explain a little bit more about your current role, uh, Director of Development and Communication at you know, for some of us, we might not be familiar with what that means. Sure. So as Director of Development and Communications at Overbrook School for the Blind, I am responsible for all of the communications and philanthropic um, fundraising that we do at the school. So we have internal and external communications, all of which I oversee a team um, that manages and, and produces the material that goes into all our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, developing the website, um, any internal communications, newsletters, um, email solicitations, Giving Tuesday, all those kinds of things. Um, and the development piece is working with individuals, major donors, foundations, corporations, special events, um, planned giving, pretty much anything, uh, any mechanism with which um, we have the opportunity to create relationships and generate philanthropic revenue to, to help run the school's programs. That's so interesting. I'm sure it's surprising for someone who might be new to uh, working with individuals who are visually impaired uh, that you could be a director of communication that involved a lot of written materials like uh, sending emails, uh, using social media, and yet all the digi digital uh, literature is totally acceptable for someone who visually impaired where through screen magnification program, screen reader, braille display, um, you name it, um, you know, just because you have a visual impairment doesn't mean you can't handle written materials in a uh, workplace setting. It's so great to hear uh, that you are able to do all that. How did you land your current role uh, at the Oberbrook School? What led you um, to that role? Yeah, so um, I was um, just kind of always, I've always tried to keep my, my pulse on the nonprofit sector to see what's going on and, and what's where as I sort of set out my goals to, to you know, sort of advance my career and, and gain experience, um, always with a focus on missions that are near and dear to my heart. Um, although it's not necessary to have a direct connection to an organization, to a mission that you're working for, for me, that's, that's something has, that has been really um, the most rewarding. Although I've also worked for organizations that I have had no direct connection to the cause and found those rewarding as well. But um, being back in the, the blindness community is, is really awesome. I'm excited about it. And it's just, it, it's, it's a very natural fit for me and something that I, I really consider myself fortunate to have the opportunity to do. Um, I saw the posting um, that Overbrook was looking for the Director of Development Communications, and I knew that my credentials and my education qualified me for the position. And um, I applied and I went through a very extensive, um, probably the most extensive um, and challenging interview process that I've ever um, gone through. It, it was very comprehensive and um, it was definitely extensive. And 
on top of that, it was in the midst of a pandemic, so it was on Zoom. So that was a bit of an adjustment, although that would have been an adjustment for anyone <laughs> um, and, and surely was. Um, I started my career um, after graduate school. I moved back to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was from. And uh, Pittsburgh was not a very accessible city in regards to being able to get around independently. And for me, I need to be able to come and go as I so choose, whether it be bus, train, walk, run with my guide dog, whatever. I need to be able to, to be able to get around independently whenever I need to go someplace. And um, so I moved to Philadelphia on a Greyhound bus because I felt that Philadelphia was a more accessible environment. And um, I was doing sort of an internship postgraduate work with um, a blind sports organization. Through that, I was connected with an individual who worked at the Overbrook School for the Blind, uh, who ended up being my guide runner for the 1996 Paralympic Games. And so I spent a lot of time on Overbrook's campus meeting up with the, my guide runner who was currently still at o Overbrook and an orientation mobility instructor. And I would meet up with him at the end of the day to go out for a run and do our workouts. And I became more uh, familiar with the school and eventually there was a position available. I applied for it. It was a substitute, long-term substitute teaching position. I applied for it and was accepted. And um, that's when my initial career with Overbrook um, began. And then I was working in the international program, which um, had a program on campus in the Philadelphia area, but eventually uh, turned truly international and no longer has a, a program on campus. So I went on to explore other opportunities within fundraising um, because I had become friends with the director of development at Overbrook and his staff while there, really liked what they were doing and decided that that's a career path I would pursue. So, you know, 20 years later to be back at Overbrook in that position, sort of the position that began my fundraising career is, is very exciting. And I feel very fortunate to be, to be in this role. That's so incredible. And yeah, transportation is one of the biggest issues that still, um, it's very challenging to a lot of us who are blind or visually impaired, uh, being able to get around, um, you know, most of us are unable to uh, drive a vehicle at that time, although maybe Tesla will change that in the future with self-driving cars that could be changing. Um, but for now, you know, taking buses, taking trains, uh, taking paratransit, um, using your guide dog walk around, um, you know, those are the best means to get around and it's really important um, if you don't work somewhere to have uh, method of transport to and from there. I know uh, my wife and I, we moved closer, closer to Boston uh, than uh, where I initially lived just to be closer to a lot of the transportation options that are open to us. Um, but, you know, one of the really cool things that's happened, um, you know, with the pandemic, uh, um, however unfortunate it has been, um, one um, area that been pretty cool it's seeing the option for zoom webinars and zoom meetings and seeing people use more digital technology um that is acceptable and um you know break down some of the transportation barriers um you know people were working remotely during the pandemic um so it's hard to say someone who blind or visually impaired can't work a particular job um if they can't get there if you know, they can do it from the comfort of their home where they know the layout, they know how to get around and um, it's a good option for some of us and uh, hopefully employers will uh, use that in the future. Um, one of the things you mentioned is a guide runner. Um, some people might not be familiar with what a guide runner is. Do you mind explaining what a guide runner is? Sure. Um, so uh, my visual impairment is to the extent that I'm unable to um, run independently without pretty much crashing and <laughs> not, not getting too far. And so um, I utilize an individual to run alongside me. Um, depending on the terrain and the distance, we might use a tether, which is a, basically if you would take a shoelace, tie the two ends together and form a loop, that's approximately the, the size of a tether. So I would hold on to one end of it and the guide runner would hold on to the other. And um, we go out for a run and that person um, basically guides through through the connection that we create through the tether and also some um, verbal feedback. And then of course, um, you can, you know, if you're, if you're running next to the person and, and your arms are touching, you can get a sense of, of the terrain underneath them, which means that's what you're, you're kind of gonna be running into as well. So the guide runner basically serves as the eyes that makes it possible for me to um, 
to run. That's really incredible. Um, and I like to use guide runners myself. Um, I'm no Paralympian, uh, but I've run a few marathons and uh, done some ultra marathon relays. Um, so it's pretty cool to see a number of us out there using guide runners. Um, there are a lot of great uh, resources for finding guide runners. Um, I know Achille International re regularly provide guide runners here in Boston. We have Team with a Vision that provide guide runners. Um, and there are websites um, that um, are dedicated to finding guide runners in your area as well um, for people who are interested in doing that. Uh, probably the safest way for us to run, even if uh, you're someone who has some usable vision, it's always safer to run with a guide runner. Um, and I find most people enjoy volunteering and running and helping others uh, find their passion in running. Um, the running community is just an amazing place uh, to be. Um, it's probably the least judgmental community I've ever found. Um, so definitely check out those resources and find yourself a guide runner if you're interested in learning how to run uh, while blind or visually impaired. Um, one question I do have for you is uh, how did you get started in running? So um, fortunately for me, my um, elementary school required all sixth graders before they moved on to junior high to participate in a um, district-wide track and field event. And um, so we were basically forced to participate in the track and field event. And at first I had a little bit of terror strike me because I thought, what on earth am I going to do? I cannot, you know, I can't, I can't see well. I'm, I'm, I was tiny, so it was obvious to me I wasn't going to be able to to be particularly successful in the throwing events. I, I did not have pure speed. Um, fortunately, something that I don't know what it was, but something came over me. I decided that I was going to run the 800 meters, which was the longest race offered, which is two laps around the track or a half mile. Um, and then I went home and told my parents that I was going to be running the 800 meters and that I would win. And uh, I just got this idea stuck in my head that I was going to go out there and I was going to win that race no matter what. And I started running circles around my house, like on, in the yard to like supposedly train for this 800 meter event. And um, I, I went to the track the day of the, the race and um, it was a fifth mile track, which you don't often see. So it's five laps to the mile. So a half mile or 800 meters would be two and a half laps which means you start in one place and you stop in another. And at the start line, they pointed and showed everyone where you would stop for the end of the race. I could not see it. I couldn't really see the other people that were in the race with me. My race plan was get off the line, get out there in front and run as fast as you can until you cross that finish line. Because if you get mixed up in a pack, you're done. You're not, you know, I'm gonna, I knew I would trip up and, and crash and burn and, um, so I ran that race and fortunately for me, I did cross the finish line. I did not know that I had crossed the finish line. So I kept running and one of the teachers had to run, run after me and stop me. Uh, fortunately for me, I refined my knowledge of where to start and stop in a race <laughs> over the course of time. But um, so I, I, I ran that race, I won that race. It was clear that I had some, some natural talent and um, probably more importantly, I, I think that um, I set my mind on that that was going to be an opportunity for me to show my classmates that I, I could be successful just as they were. And, um, and I, I think I just, that's where my little bit of a stubborn streak kicked in and um, that kicked off a really nice running career for me. It definitely had its challenges and it, it's had to overcome some obstacles along the way that were related to, to visual impairment. And, um, I, you know, I ultimately I did. It, you know, you, you look at the start and you look at the, the culmination of my years at the international level with, with all the success that I had. But what's really important to note is that it was a long journey. You know, I, I competed at the international level for 16 years. Prior to that, I competed in uh, high school and then I tried to compete in college, but visual issues made that very challenging until I, I learned about the concept of using a guide runner. Um, but more important is the journey from the beginning to the end and all that I learned throughout that that journey and, um, you know, the success and the failures because the failures built the success and, you know, without the challenges and, and without having to face the, the, the 
discrimination about running in a meet with guide runners and and you know without falling on my face time and again literally and and having to get back up and keep going um i don't think it would have i would be the person that i am today and i don't think that i would have encountered the success that i have if i didn't have the sum of all the years of uh triumph and challenge that went into to my long career definitely it sounds like it taught you a lot about hard work uh and learning from failure you know it happened to all of us uh, you know we uh fail here and there in little ways and we should grow from there uh learn how to do a better process how to manage our time better um you name it um it just helped to grow with people um it sounds like running was a great uh tool for you to learn no life lessons and get ready for the workforce um as well as just general life uh you know skills and so I really like your point about equity and running and being able to impress your peers. Uh, one of the reasons why I love running so much is just that, um, you know, you're often out there with people who are typically sighted. Um, you might be out there with other blind and visually impaired athletes, um, although there's not many of us, so we tend to be a small crowd if we if there are others out there uh, on a particular race course um, and other people with disabilities as well um, and you know nobody can take away any achievement you've done uh, out there on the track because um, you know if you beat everyone you beat everyone um, and you know just because you need a guide runner doesn't make a big difference you ran all the steps uh, you pushed yourself you did all the training you did attended all the practices um, and you know nobody can take that achievement away from you um, you know people are just amazed and impressed uh, by everything you do um, on a daily basis um, and so um, you mentioned that um, the start of your running, um, but what was it like um, as far as the Paralympic trial than your first time attending the Paralympic? Yeah, so um, the, the Paralympics was a new concept for me. It was uh, sort of a, an unplanned um, introduction to the to Paralympic movement occurred while I was actually fulfilling um, some curriculum hour obligations at, at the university level. My friend and I were volunteering at a clinic for individuals with disabilities. It was a multi-sport clinic. I was a physical education major. So I, my friend and I, we showed up. Um, she wasn't formally guiding for me, but she informally guided for me on a regular basis. And uh, we were working together and someone noticed, um, one of the coaches who had experience working with the blind and visually impaired noticed that she was sort of informally guiding me and that, that coach approached us and asked if I knew about the Paralympic Games. I said, I had not known about the Paralympic Games. I had just ended my collegiate career because my vision had gotten to the point where I was really, I was falling and, and just pretty much putting myself in a very unsafe situation day in and day out, going out on the roads as a distance runner. So I learned about the games and um, it was a whole new concept for me and I decided to em embark on it. It came at a really critical time for me. I, my father was terminally ill and uh, it was a chance for me to get back into running while he was still, still um, with us. And it was nice for him to be able to see me have these doors opened. And um, it was also a good outlet for me to manage the, the stress that came with, with that. And um, so I was, I ran one race, I did really well just on my natural ability. They noticed, they recruited me. I was invited to go to the test event for the 1992 um, Barcelona Paralympics, which was took place in the summer of 1991. At that event, it was a pretty high level event. It was uh, in Barcelona, Spain. It was literally a test event for them to sort of test out the, the, new, the facilities and, and give a run through of the event. So um, that was my first exposure to international competition. So I kind of, you know, went from zero, zero to 100 real quick. And um, it, it worked out really well for me, obviously, I, I, um, about um, a little bit after that, I had lost my father and uh, uh, in his final days, I had promised them, him that I would win a gold medal because he was always my biggest running fan and supported me and always he taught me that if I believed in myself and I worked hard, 
that I would be successful, you know, that I would fall down along the way, but somebody would be there to reach out and lift me and that I should do the same for others in the course of my life. And so I had some really valuable you know, life lessons in a very short period of time as a 22 year old. Um, again, I think all of those built in helping me become the person that I am today. And um, so the, the Paralympic Games are just um, for worked out, uh, just demonstrate grit because my first event was my, most likely to win a gold in. And unfortunately there were, for me, the Russian athletes cut between me and my guide 50 meters from the finish line. And we were separated and I was basically at a loss from a visual standpoint. And uh, we ended up coming in third. So that was, that was pretty harsh. Um, you know, I was mad and angry and frustrated and, and disappointed all at once. Um, and I crumbled, I crumbled to the ground that night because that, that truly was my, my primary event for winning gold. But I, I said to myself, well, I have two more chances. You know, I have an 800 and a 3000 and I know technically I'm not supposed to win those races, but you know, I'm, I'm not out of this yet. I have one strike and I have two more to go. So I built myself up very quickly, got back up, had a great group of people around me, um, went to the 800. I knew the odds for me on the 800 were not great, but I went out there and I gave it my best shot and figured, you know, worst case scenario is I get more experience of going through that intense process of the warm up track and the call room and all those other things. And I ended up third again. And, um, and then my final event was the 3000 meter. Um, and, you know, I went out there and, and I didn't crumble after the 800. I was disappointed, but I, but I also knew that my better chance was the 3000 and I just used it as fuel for my fire. And um, I had a lot of teammates in the stands. I could hear them cheering for me throughout the course of the 3000. And I was very fortunate to cross the line first and, and, and achieve that goal of, of winning a gold medal. So you know, in a span of about eight days, I had went through pretty much every emotion there was to go through. But um, at that point, demonstrated to myself that that if I could fight through that, um, you know, the, the challenges that I would face throughout my life as a result of being a person with a visual impairment, a person considered to have a disability, um, I would be able to make it. So, um, I'm wow, wow, I'm just beat bush. Um, that uh, incredible uh, emotional journey. Um, going from the U.S. all the way to Spain and uh, your first international event and telling your dad that you were going to win gold. That's so incredible. Um, I don't think um, a lot of us would have that emotional integrity to be able to hold it all together and push through um, that after losing that first event that it, feel, it felt like you were robbed um, of that event. Um, you know, be able to get back on the horse again and uh, keep at it. That's so impressive. Um, you know, I wish I could teach all my students how to, uh, you know, take a failure and should turn it into uh, gold. Um, that's I think, so incredible. I think a really, really, really important part of that was not as much about me, but as the people that I surrounded myself with and, and, and the energy and the belief in me that they conveyed. And, uh, you know, there were 80,000 people in the stands the night I won the 8,000. And uh, I literally heard my circle of friends um, in the stands. I knew where they were. And every time I passed, I heard them. And that just gave me, I mean, you know, they, they took away from their preparation schedule to come to the track to be there for me. And, uh, and then just the, the number of people, you know, my siblings, my mom, um, my coaches, guide runners, you know, there were a lot of people along the, the way that, that made sacrifices so that I would be in a position to be where I was that day. So again, I think it's really important to, to build your team or your community or, you know, your family of supporters that are there for you all the time and, and go through the challenges and also celebrate the success because, you know, none of us are, none of us accomplish what we do without the support and love of others. Definitely. Uh, and I'm so incredibly lucky to have the parents I had going through school, 
who advocated for my needs um and that led me down the path of you know where i am today um you know as a teacher and i'm sure you had a similar support system it sounds like your parents were always there supporting you your siblings were there rooting you on and um uh, just wanted to you to succeed uh, in your whatever it was career or um, winning the Paralympic Games. Uh, that's so incredible. Uh, what was it like um, the first time being in a large, uh, running in a large crowd like that with a large audience? Uh, was it intimidating or was it easy for you? Um, you know, it was, I won't say it's easy, it's never easy. I mean, I'm pretty good at managing my, um, my anxiety or, you know, my stressors. And, um, you know, I think I believed in me. I believed in the team that I had. I believed in, in the time and the effort that I put into the preparation. Um, I believed that I had the ability to put myself in a position to come out and, and, you know, maximize my ability. And um, the, the large crowd was great, but I was very focused. I was very focused, you know. Um, it, it was a challenge to, to, to parse out the, you know, and compartmentalize the emotions, you know, the, the emotions of the warm up at the warm up track. Uh, there was a song I played over and over and over. It was called I'll Be There by Escape Club. And, you know, it was just over mountains. Through, through across the seas, I'll be there for you. And so it, it just, I had that presence of, you know, the, the power of my father's memory and um, just being able to, to compartmentalize and, and believe in myself and know that the preparation, I had done everything that I could do, you know, and that's, that's all we can do anytime, you know, if, whether it's preparing for the Paralympic games or preparing for an interview or preparing for an exam in college, if you do, if you prepare yourself in the best way possible, if you put the time in, you put the effort in, you address the areas of a subject, you know, a subject area that you aren't particularly strong in by getting extra help, by getting a tutor, or if you practice your interview skills, or you practice pretending you make eye contact because you truly can't see someone. Um, if you practice those things, You've done everything you can do to put yourself in a position to come out where you need to come out and whatever whatever the activity is. And so I think believing believing in yourself and believing the time and the effort that you put into preparation um, help manage that that anxiety and the stressors. Definitely, um, I I uh, totally agree with you. I always like be a hundred prepared. 100% prepared, um, whether it, you know, a running event or, you know, just getting ready for work, uh, making sure your schedule is all set for the day, uh, making sure you're well prepared, you have everything you need when you leave the house, um, especially for those of us who are blind or visually impaired, there's no going back when you leave the house, uh, there's no quick turnaround in a car, um, you know, if you're taking fire transit or a bus, you're kind of stuck when you leave the house, so always being prepared and managing those anxiety and stress level are really important. Um, I know for me, having my guide dog help with my stress a little bit, you know, if I'm feeling a little anxious, I can kind of better a little bit. That's not definitely her job. She's not a emotional support animal, uh, but she does help my anxiety a little bit. Um, she's pretty incredible. Um, as far as the Paralympic goes, is there a training camp that helped you be prepared uh, prior to the attending the Paralympic? Um, so we had we had uh, lots of different uh, training camps, um, and there is always a pre-training camp. and And the Paralympic Games has have evolved so much. Um, you know, my my first games in 1992 as an athlete, we paid to go be part of the team, U.S. team and to go to the Paralympic Games. And so they've they've really evolved, and there are lots lots more opportunities that that exist. And so um, there wasn't any particular training camp. Um, but it's really different now. I was able to both manage um, my Paralympic aspirations as well as uh, develop my career. Did my athletics pay a price for that? They did. But ultimately, at, at that point, for me, it was worth it because I had career goals as well as, as, as athletic goals. And um, so, you know, I, I chose to sort of take a, a happy medium or balance. Uh, would I appreciate the opportunity to be in the 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 current games, if I were younger in a position that these athletes are in to be able to train and focus full time, 
Absolutely. I think that probably would have changed the trajectory of my career. Um, my first games was my most, been most successful from a medal standpoint. And um, I was working on my graduate degree at the time. So I really had ample time to train and recover. Whereas the other games I was working full time and uh, growing my career. So I definitely compromised, you know, improvised and compromised my, my training, but that was a choice I made. So um, that's incredible. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is limited time and so uh you have to balance all your aspirations and uh achieve what you uh want to achieve and devote your time appropriately to however you see fit um i would imagine with running and training for the paralympic um all the times and uh even when you were in high school running uh or at the college level running um you had to uh set goals in order to uh accomplish what you want to accomplish how has goal setting contributed to your success uh as far as your career goes goal setting is critical in all aspects of our life i am a big uh, believer in setting a goal uh, you can always adjust and amend the goal as it evolves over time because you know, the, the steps along the journey to achieve the goal are going to sort of drive and determine how you may or may not have to, you know, determine if the goal you originally set was realistic. And so you have to adjust. And, and so goal setting is really critical. And I believe that it gives you direction. Uh, it sort of outlines the journey that you're going to take by committing to those goals. But I think it's not just about one big goal, but it's lots of little steps throughout the process. So you know, creating that master goal is important and energizing and sort of visionary, whereas it's also important to um, <coughs> excuse me, map out little goals along the way so that you can monitor your progress and improve the process that you're, as you strive to reach the larger goal. Um, for me, writing the goal down is really important. You know, I used to, when I was trained from <coughs> Barcelona, I would write down, beat the Russian, <laughs> because my biggest competitor was a Russian athlete. So as soon as I wrote it down, it happened. I had said it, but writing it down definitely made the difference. Um, so writing them down or brailing them, <coughs> excuse me, or no problem. putting them in audio format, um, whatever works for you, whatever accommodates your vision um, is really important because that's going to drive it's going to drive the path you take to achieve the goal. And it's important to not give up on the goal when the times get tough, but just maybe re reassess the littler goals that you outlined in order to reach the bigger goal. Definitely. I love that point. Um, I know for me, uh, running marathons, a lot of people are like, how do I even get started? Um, and I tell people all the time, you you probably could run a marathon. Um, it, you know, it's definitely achievable for 99% of people out there. The you know, the bigger challenge is how to break you up into smaller steps. Um, you know, you can't not train and go out tomorrow and run a marathon. You'll get injured. You'll probably get taken out at some point. Uh, the key is break it up into smaller bits. Um, you know, maybe do a start off with a 5K, work your way up to a 10K, work your way up to a half marathon. Once you feel pretty comfortable with that half marathon, unfortunately, there's a giant jump to the full marathon, but um, you know, maybe you can do um, a forward and backward tap marathon and feel pretty comfortable doing it um, and you're ready for a marathon. Um, you know, I think most goals are pretty achievable if you're willing to uh, break it down into smaller bits, write it down, uh, figure out a process to that smaller goal and eventually you'll achieve that master goal. Um, we're about 40 minutes in. Um, if people would like to submit a question for the Q&A, there is a Q&A bot in the Zoom chat. Um, at this point, I would like to turn it over to Alicia to see if we have any questions from uh, people in the audience. Great, thank you so much. This has been a great, great conversation so far. Um, yeah, questions are, are open, so definitely submit some. We have one to get us started, and I think you guys just actually just started touching on this, but um, Pam, what advice or tips would you have for somebody who's starting a, a running regimen? So I, I think um, that's a good question, actually. You know, uh, be consistent, identify some, some goals that you have, 
um, depending on where you're starting, you know, maybe it's a matter of, okay, um, you know, maybe your first goal is to be able to run a mile. And so you might want to start by running for two minutes and then walking for two minutes and then running for two minutes and then walking for two minutes and do that, you know, just do that for sort of determine what your goal to run the mile would be and then sort of break it out and walk and, and do some run, do some walk. Um, find, find a partner, find someone to go out with if, if you aren't guide dependent, but if you are guide dependent, you know, find a number of different guides so that you don't have to be dependent on the same person all the time. Um, find different places to run so that it's not the same thing all the time if you can. And I realize as a visually impaired runner, it's very nice to run the same thing over and over sometimes, but it's actually really healthy to, to break it up and to try new things. Um, if you're guide dependent, I'd say be patient as you teach someone to become a guide runner because it takes time both for you to get comfortable with them and them to get comfortable with you. And, um, you know, again, just set, sm set small goals. Uh, don't do too much too soon. You know, don't go, set, don't, you know, start out. You, you haven't run and you don't have a, a fitness background. Don't start by running seven days a week. Maybe run four days a week or two days a week run and two days a week walk, sort of mix it up and um, be patient and, um, you know, stick, stick with it. Find a group if you can. Um, Achilles has, Achilles has lots of different um, clubs across the country, different, different cities. Uh, find those groups. The, um, oh my gosh, Brian, I'm totally having a blank, but the, um, the website. Oh, you think, uh, United and Stride. It's a Thank website. You. Um, where people can find guide runners. Um, it's run out of um, the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired here in Boston. Uh, but obviously the website is nationwide. It's a great uh, tool for finding guide runners in your area. You just sign up. Um, you sign up as a, if you're a visually impaired, as a visually impaired runner, um, inside a guide will find you. Um, and it's a great way for uh, you to find sighted guides and for them to uh, gain experience, uh, contribute to running in a way that they haven't before. Um, you know, these people are runners themselves and just want to share that passion for running. Um, and I would also add, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to a local running group. Um, I've trained with uh, the Norwood Running Group um, and they've been absolutely wonder, uh, sorry, not Norwood, Norfolk uh, running group um, near my home. And they're absolutely wonderful. I just reached out to them, knew someone who would part of that running group. Um, at any time I can reach out and I'll find a runner because they all know me now uh, after making that initial uh, reach out. And so, you know, they love running um, and they're happy to share that passion with someone else. Um, you mentioned that you have a running guide dog uh, from Jeb, uh, Guiding Eye for the Blind. Um, can you talk about what, maybe some of the difference is between a human guide versus a guide dog? Sure. So Maida has been with me for six years now, and um, I had actually stopped running uh, just because uh, coordinating the guide runners with a family and a, a work schedule was just really challenging. So I stopped running. And then um, as I was approaching time for my second guide dog, the guiding eyes had the pilot program for the running guide dogs. And I signed up for it. And I, it was phenomenal for me from the beginning. I mean, Maida and I are a great team. We're a great match. And I know Brian can speak to this with intrigue. Um, having the opportunity to just go out the door at any time, whenever you want to run with your dog is awesome. I mean, just that for me as a mom and, and, a, and someone who works full time, uh, balancing all the things on my plate is really challenging, but to be able to just like say, hey, Maida, let's go at any given time and to go out the door and go for a run, which is just awesome. It was such a feeling of independence. And I still, to this day, every time I go out the door, I have to pinch myself because I never thought that I would be able to run independently like that. And um Maida is totally a born runner and um, she loves to run and we do trails, we do, you know, typical sidewalks on a, you know, sort of a city street, we do suburban uh, sidewalk running. Um, it, it's, it's an incredible experience and I, words can't come close to capturing what it's given me and what it means to me because, you know, it, it took my, my love of running was kind of, I had 
come to terms with that it was done and it was just gonna be a casual situation. But um, her coming into my life as a running guide dog gave me back running, it gave me the opportunity to coach. I was coaching a, a K through eighth grade team and we were out on a three mile, three mile trail. It was a circle and there were cut throughs in the middle and Maida, and with Maida by my side, I was able to jump between groups and work with my different, different levels of the kids on the team. I mean, it was just an awesome. So what guiding eyes gave me when they gave me Maida as a running guide dog was something I never thought would be possible. Um, it means the world to me and I am forever grateful. And I, um, I cherish, cherish her by my side every day. That's so incredible. Um, and I would imagine you bring Maida with you to the workplace as well. Um, for, you know, a lot of people probably don't work in a workspace where there is a dog, whether it be a service dog or a guide dog. Um, how could someone be an ally to someone who's visually impaired in the workplace with a guide dog? What, what are some best practices that you recommend? Yeah, so this is probably one of those do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> Maid is getting older, so she's she's had a little bit more flexibility in, in the workplace. But um, yeah, so it, I think just educating those around you on what the expectations are and um, and 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 sharing those expectations and understanding of the role of the guide dog with the others in the work environment is really important because it's so tempting to you know, reach out and touch the dog and play with the dog and engage the dog. And so, you know, the more of us that are out there educating the public on what the expectation is and, and what the expected role is, is really important. And even when I give um, people the opportunity to, to interact with Maida, I always reinforce to them that it's really important that, um, that we're all cognizant of the, the different degrees in which handlers operate with their dogs, um, depending on the situation. But I, you know, ideally, definitely, you know, making sure that, that people understand what the role of the dog is and the expectation of those around you. Yeah, definitely. Those guide dogs, they have a really important role. Um, it get us from point A to point B as safely as possible. Um, and I know as a new father, uh, my guide dog not only guided me, but my uh, little daughter as well. So uh, it's extra, extra important that people do not disrupt the guide dog while they're working and um, going about their job. Uh, one of the statistics I read, um, it was a few years ago, that guide dog that we only work 15% of the day, which means if you see a guide dog in harness, um, that, that, you know, a small portion of the, their day. Uh, most of the time, guide dogs are off the harness. They're running around playing. Uh, people are always surprised when they see me at my house and uh, my guide dog just running around with, um, you know, uh, the other dogs and uh, my daughter, Siobhan. And so, you know, uh, keep in mind that, you know, they are working, uh, but they're working for a small portion of the day. Uh, if you really want to uh, and get to know the dog, then uh, get to know the owner. And before you know it, uh, you'll be able to play with the dog um, in an appropriate setting. Um, you know, obviously with the workplace, they got to be able to guide us from meeting to meeting, um, you know, running to the grocery store, they got to help us guide us around the grocery store. Um, but, you know, there are plenty of opportunity to get to play with a guide dog um, if you get to know someone with a guide dog. Um, as far as, you know, working with someone, I would imagine you work in a workplace where most people are typically cited, um, as I do, even though I work for a school for the blind. Um, there are other uh, people who I work with who are blind or visually impaired, but um, there are also a lot of people who are typically cited. Um, how could someone who um, is a colleague uh, be an ally to you in the workplace? Yeah, so we have a campus just like you, you all do at Perkins. And so, um, you know, we work with lots of people that we may not interact with or see on a regular basis. And as good as um, I think we end up being over time with, with voice recognition, um, for me, it's, it's really helpful when people identify themselves. If, if we're, you know, from out and about on campus and somebody says hi, sometimes I know who's saying hi to me, but many times I don't unless they identify themselves. Um, also, just like if there are if there are uh, change, you know, if there's construction going on in the area, 
um, you know, letting me know about it is really helpful. Um, you know, I have certain little things that I ask my team members, you know, not to do, like writing me a note in cursive. I can't read cursive no matter how beautiful it might look or how neat it might be or how legible it is to the typical person. I really need sort of the, you know, the 2020 pin with block lettering. Um, so I think it just, I, for me, it's just helping people become aware of what my needs are, um, which I'm not always good at doing, quite frankly. Um, so just because I'm, I, I tend to be a little stubborn on the, on the independence part, but I'm trying to teach my son who's also visually impaired that, you know, it, it is okay to ask for help and to let people know what, what makes things easier for you. There's nothing wrong with it, but that's actually positive. It's positive for me or any individual. And it's also positive for the, those who are typically sighted because they can have a better understanding of, of the needs and how to, you know, to be more comfortable around somebody who sees differently than they do. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. I know for me, um, you know, people are always wondering how they can uh, write something down for me. And I say, you know, just send me a text message, um, you know, that's easy enough. I'll be able to read it with the voiceover on the iPhone and hear it and um, know what uh, what they're looking for. Maybe they're sending me a group list or, um, you know, anything at all, um, email. Um, and we all have different needs, no matter what kind of visual impairment you have, uh, you know, getting to know that coworker and knowing what their personal needs are and what works best for them is really important. Um, you know, in career launch, we have a lot of people who are just starting out in their careers. Uh, we serve um, uh, students who are age 18 to 35, and a lot of them are just graduating high school. Some of them graduated college. Some of them uh, did not complete college, or uh, we've even had um, one uh, student with a, a graduate degree uh, come through our program. Um, for those are, that are um, starting out in their career, what kind of advice would you give them? No. Um... Be realistic with your expectations in the sense that, you know, even though it should be that, that you know, people are comfortable um, working with individuals who have, have uh, disabilities, it's not always the case. So realize and accept that, that you're going to encounter some of that. And, and some people are going to want to be helpful and other people are going to eliminate you as a candidate right, right off the bat. But the most important thing is that to remember that you've prepared yourself, that you've done the homework, so to speak. You're, you're doing the right things and, and there will be positive experiences and there will be experiences that cause you frustration. But believe in the work that you've done and believe in people and, and, and our community and our society that eventually you're gonna land on your feet. Um, I have had plenty of interviews where, you know, I before I was in the, you know, as I put one foot through the threshold of the door, the interview was already over. You know, I've had other opportunities where it was clear I should have received an interview and I did not because they determined on my resume about my visual impairment. So no, that's gonna happen. And yes, it's a bummer. And yes, it can be frustrating, but you know, also know that there are plenty of other opportunities out there and the landscape is starting to change and get better. And you know, tap into the resources that exist if you're in the career launch program talk to Brian because he's a great example of somebody who's out there and he's, he's employed and he has a family and he's, he has all these goals and, and he's reaching them. And, and I'm sure he'll echo, you know, he echoes what I've seen that it's, it's not always been easy. And, you know, there are times that, you know, you come home and you might just like totally have a meltdown because you just encountered nothing but, you know, negative attitude throughout the course of the day around vision. But, there are also going to be days where it's great and people get it and they embrace you and they they they're excited and encouraged to to give you an opportunity um, and so just just keep putting one foot in front of the other and, and when times get challenging reach out to people around you in the blindness community which is a phenomenal group of people who understand and appreciate all that we go through because we, we're all going through it and so be there to to rely on them for the the cumulative strength of the community itself. I think that's been really beneficial. And I didn't have access to the blindness community until I, my first Paralympic Games. And um, 
wow, what a difference it's made in my life. And some of my uh, best friends have been met within my blindness community experience, whether they themselves are visually impaired or blind may not be the case. Maybe they were a teacher, maybe they were a coach, maybe they were a guide, but they were all people that look at each of us as people and, and not as somebody who's blind. So, you know, just, just keep putting one foot in front of the other, set your goals, prove through your actions that, 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 we, that we as a community and you as an individual are capable and have something to give. And in time, uh, things will line up. Good night, agree any more. Uh, well said. Um, Oija, do we have any question from the Q&A? Maybe we can take one last question. Um, we do not have any questions. Awesome. Uh, so probably a good point to leave it on the importance of networking, uh, reaching out to those uh, individuals who are blind and visually impaired. It's never been easier with social media to uh, find people in your local area. Maybe they're part of AFB or NFB or any of the alphabet words. Um, you know, you can find people in your area who are blind or visually impaired or who are passionate about running. Um, I would absolutely love um, everything you've said, uh, especially the part about the importance of your father because uh, as a newly father, uh, that's important to me. Uh, I get the, the lot of pressure on me to raise uh, the net gold medal at Paralympian. Um, thank you so much for being here, Pam. Thank you for having me, Brian. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity. And you know, if there's if there's anyone who would like to receive more information about running or or networking or whatever, you can find my contact information on the Old Books Book of Blind website, and um, feel free to reach out to me. Brian also has my contact information, obviously. Of course. Uh, thank you so much, Pam. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, don't forget to check out the Career Launch website. Uh, we do have rolling admission for the fall if people are interested in checking out Career Launch. Uh, we're also running two tech boot camps over the summer, uh, working on productivity tooled for the workplace, uh, typically the Google Suite um, using your AT devices and Microsoft Suite uh, using your AT devices. They're both one week uh, boot camp to help you uh, in whatever stage of life you're in. Um, you know, if you're interested, please do uh, check out our website or reach out to Dina Kreese in uh, our, um, you know, our uh, career launch department. Um, United and Strided, a really big website too, if you're looking for guide runners, um, it's pretty easy to find on the web. Um, so be sure to check out all those resources. It's never been easier to find guide runners and accomplish whatever goal you're searching for. Thank you, everyone.